Um, let's see. So fatty acids, um, obviously we know fatty acids are used to store energy. In fact, they store more than carbohydrates do. Um, they are also in use in film, cell membranes, and then they are also used um, in complexes <clears throat> uh, with proteins. So they're called lipoproteins. Lipo is lipid fats. <clears throat> um, a lot of the steroid hormones like uh, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and a bunch of others are all lipoproteins, a combination of a fat <clears throat> and a protein. Um, <clears throat> in terms of diabetes, um, it used to be thought that we get um, that that our blood sh that our um, cholesterol. Well, first of all, our cholesterol is affected by what we eat, but it turns out that. Dietary cholesterol, stuff that you eat, let's say a nice big fat ribeye steak, which has a lot of saturated fat in it, it doesn't, it's not dumped into your bloodstream. The, the liver produces all the cholesterol, okay? Now, so there's an um, indirect way in terms of what you eat and what happens in the liver, um, but the liver is essentially making all the cholesterol. So there's different kinds of cholesterol. Um, there are high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins. What you really want, first of all, you want your cholesterol below like 200. But the main thing is you want a high ratio of HDL over LDL. So LDL, low density, is actually kind of bad cholesterol. What it does is it accumulates on the arterial wall and then eventually um, forms kind of like a clot. And that's where you get heart attacks and strokes and all that. So, um, but we need cholesterol. It's a very, very important, um, it serves a very, very important function in terms of carrying other things with it. Okay. Now, um, carbohydrates, of course, are saccharides. So lipids are fats. Saccharides are sugars. There's simple sugars, like a monosaccharide, like um, glucose. And then there are <clears throat> disaccharides, um, like... Uh, lactose, and then there's polysaccharides, which many, many, many long chains of um, carbon and hydrogen, and those are complex sugars. And they have to be, to be used, they actually have to be broken down into glucose, at which point then they'll um, go, go, go through glucose metabolism and uh, be stored as glycogen or burned up as energy where you actually get, what do you get when you burn up glucose? Starts with an A. ATP. Okay, so if you remember glucose metabolism, <clears throat> you have one molecule of glucose and then you, um, and oxygen, and then you end up with CO2 and ATP. Now, it depends on whether you do a fermentation pathway or the whole um, uh, Krebs cycle pathway. So fermentation, you get only two ATPs. This is, uh, and this is what happens when your body, you're, let's say, running a marathon, you hit the wall. There's no more glycogen to burn, okay? So you build up lactic acid. This is, you get two ATPs, not very much. The other way, you either get 32 or 38 ATPs, a lot more. <clears throat> um, fiber is also made up of um, 
sugars, but it's used mainly as a structural protein. Mm -hmm. A structural protein. I mean, stru structural um, uh, basis for holding plants up and all that. So, like when you burn wood, you're burning cellulose. We can't ourselves actually digest cellulose. Um, now, a lot of animals can, but only with the help of bacteria. <coughs> so termites need bacteria to actually break down cellulose. Cows need bacteria to help them break down cellulose. They can get energy from it, but they need a lot of it. Okay. Hmm. So are potatoes complex or simple car carbohydrates? What do you think? Do you think long chains of sugars or just a short chain of sugar? Just guess. Long. Okay, so it's a complex carbohydrate. Um, understand how glucose is metabolized. Um, in fact, what we can do is, um, yeah, I'll just keep going. Okay. And then we've got micronutrients. Now, all these things are things that we need from our diet. We can't generally get them from, make, make them, like we can make a lot of amino acids for proteins. Um, so, except for vitamin D, um, you go out in the sun, you can make uh, vitamin D. But for the most part, you have to get it from, from your, the food that you actually eat. Um, minerals are the same sort of things. Anybody remember what a antioxidants do? Well, there's free radicals. And these free radicals are highly reactive molecules. And supposedly, um, antioxidants uh, neutralize them. There's not a whole lot of evidence for that. It sounds good, but it's really never been um, properly tested, so we don't know. <coughs> okay. Okay. Um, some, why are some adults able to drink milk and others are not? Anyone? So did anybody watch that um, video called um, Got Galactose, or Got Galactase, um, Co-evolution Between Genes and Culture? I guess not. Okay, you all have to look at that. It's about 15 minutes long there's going to be at least a couple questions on there. So if you don't watch it, you won't understand. Okay. Um, <coughs> what? It's called uh, um, got galactase, or I mean lactase, got lactase, question mark. Um, and then it's a Genes by culture is called Yeah. So it's not the evolution of lactase persistence? That's right. Exactly. So it's lactase persistence. How did it evolve? Um, perhaps why it evolved as well. Um, and <clears throat> was it, was the lactase gene the one that makes the protein was that, there a mutation in that, or was there a mutation somewhere else? <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, you know what? <clears throat> we, went over <clears throat> we went over all this. Um, for saccharides or fats, if you add hydrogens um, for fats, you end up uh, uh, saturating it. And so it becomes solid at room, room temperature. That's hydrogenation. So you take a, an unsaturated fat that's like vegetable oil that's 
a uh, liquid at room temperature and it becomes like margarine. Um, saturated fats, you know what the difference is. Um, understand glucose metabolism. And, mm hmm. Okay. Oh, what's scurvy caused by? See, right. Har, matey, you scurvy dog. Um, okay. Now, in terms of metabolism, um, so how's our diet today different than the diet of our ancestors in the past? Anything? It has more flavor, like we actually use more salt. Okay, more flavor? What else? Uh, we have more to use, like, salt and then... Uh-huh, okay. We have access to a lot of things that weren't, we didn't have access to in the past. A lot more simple sugar? Yeah, so we're in a food-rich environment, right? I mean, we can go out and get food very easily. Uh, we can get lousy food that's just rich in carbohydrates and, um, and fats. Uh, or we can, you know, be all macrobiotic and become vegan. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we're not starving for calories. Now, in the past, what was it like, do you think, in terms of our ancestors? Was, were they in a food-rich environment when they were hunter-gatherers? No. So they had periodic food, food shortages, and um, to deal with that, they had certain alleles that helped them retain the calories they already had and make efficient use of calories by slowing down their metabolism. So skinny dudes and skinny ladies would die, and people who, during food... Um, the times of food plenty would put on weight and they would have a perfect metabolism for that kind of an, a food environment. So that's very um, important to understand. And so that's why diabetes, type 2 diabetes, now type 1 is an autoimmune disease, but type 2 <coughs> is actually not a disease. It's just that in one food environment where... Um, food security is not insured and, and you're likely to go through famines, that kind of phenotype is actually um, adaptive. In the common food environment that we have today where there's an overabundance of food, <clears throat> that's when you start expressing type 2 diabetes. That means that you actually, for the most part, your cells do not um, uh, process insulin properly. Um, you usually make enough of it, but <coughs> the pancreas, but the cells become resistant, insulin resistant. And so you have a whole bunch of glucose in the bloodstream circulating around, and that is not good. Okay. Um, anybody remember what, a body, what the body mass index is? Yes. Okay. So it's like, it's an NIP reading weights, but it tells you if you're obese or skinny. Right. So it's actually the weight um, over um, the height. So you would expect um, the higher the weight um, over, let's say you have one height at six foot and you're 225 pounds, and then there's another person at six foot two who's also 225 pounds. The second one, he's taller. Um, hold on a second. Yeah, so the second one would have a lower body mass than the first one. He's only six foot tall, but has more fat on him. It falls apart, of course, if you're looking at someone who's um, a weightlifter and it's all muscle. Um, 
Let's see, the whole idea about um, weight loss and dieting, calories in, calories out, um, that model has been pretty much debunked. Um, people have different kinds of metabolisms, as we mentioned. So someone who inherited a metabolism, a metabolic rate that was consistent with a food-poor environment is going to actually hang on to any kind of um, nutrients it can get. In other words, it's not going to give up the pounds. That's why it's so hard. Uh, oftentimes, you lose weight initially, and then from then on, it's a bitter battle. Because what you've done is you've told your metabolism, oh, we're going through a famine. So it holds on to everything. And um, then after you've gained it, you can never lose it again. It's this incremental. Uh, remember about um, glucose metabolism makes ATP. Um, uh, building versus breaking down. Anabolic versus catabolic. Uh, you can't do both at the same time. In other words, if you want to lose weight, um, you can't build muscle at that period of time. You can lose weight depending on your body type. And then um, afterwards you can start building muscle because then you're going to have to provide enough calories to actually do that. Okay. So why do women need more body fat than men generally? Pregnancy and lactation. Um, here's a body mass index sort of thing. Um, if you wanted to lose two pounds in one week through diet alone, how many calories? This is the, you know, calories in, calories out. So remember that you... Um, you basically, let's say you want to lose, um, let's say a pound is 3,500 calories. Um, um, through diet alone. How many calories per day would you have to cut down from your normal? Um, your normal intake. It'd be... So it's seven days, 100 calories each day for seven days. Okay, that's 3,500 calories. Oh, that's one pound, so 200 calories a day. Sorry. If you want to lose two pounds over seven days, over one week, you have to lose 200, lose 200 calories a day. Uh, more about... Um, you know, true, false, um, losing muscle or becoming, okay, so, um, <clears throat> genes code for proteins, they don't code for traits specifically, and DNA is where the code is, but the DNA itself doesn't do anything. It's just the written kind of instructions uh, modulated by um, environmental interactions. So um, we have about, actually about 19,000 genes compared to, I think, 125,000 for corn, so we're not as highly evolved as corn. Um, let's see. So there's 3 billion base pairs. Um, only about 2% actually code for proteins out of that whole 3 billion base pairs. So it's a very small amount. So what's going on with the rest of it? Um, it used to be thought that a lot of it was junk. Uh, you can find things called pseudogenes that look like genes, but they have a stop codon in the middle of it. So it looks like it's an old gene that was functional and it's no longer functional, but it's still in the genome, per se. 
Uh, there's also these transposable elements that copy themselves all over the place in the genome. But it turns out about at least 20%, maybe more, of that DNA that, that doesn't code exactly for a protein is part of the regulatory structure in terms of gene regulation and expression. So when we talked about gene expression and which genes are turned on and by how much, um, about 20% of the genome is actually dedicated to that. Okay. Um, now, of course, we get our genome from inheritance, half from our mother and half from our father. Um, individuals who have, um, like an, an adult, like one of us or a little baby or whatever, how many, are they haploid or diploid? Diploid. So one set of chromosomes from mom and an identical set of chromosomes from pa, except for differences in alleles. Okay. Now, sperm and egg are haploid. They either have a set from, um, let's say mom has a, a, a mother and a dad. She's going to donate the set from, let's say, mom for one gamete. Or it could be 50-50 chance that she donates the set from dad. Okay? So gametes only have a single set of chromosomes. And then, of course, when they fertilize, they restore the diploid state. Um, <clears throat> you can look at... Um, how the DNA is actually structured into a double helix, like a winding staircase. Um, and the important parts of the nucleotide base is collecting, the, uh, connecting the two strands. And there's always two of them, and they're complementary. So if you have an A on one side, you'll always have a T on the other, and vice versa. If you have a G, you'll have a C. So they're always complementary, and that's because of the um, biochemical nature. They don't fit together otherwise. Um, a codon, in other words, that actually codes for something, it, it codes for an amino acid, and it's always three base pairs long, always three. Um, and it, codes for one of 20 amino acids plus a stop codon. So once it reaches the end, it stops producing. That's the end of it. And it's produced a molecule, the protein. Um, remember, um, the, pro the chromosome is what is made of, made of DNA and the double helix. So the chromosome has all the different genes on it. There's a homologous pair. That means homologous the same. And that's one from mom and one from dad. So and Anyway, then right in the middle, they're tied together the central mirror. So there's one from mom and one from dad. Um, and there's 22 pairs of ideas. Yeah. Okay. So this is just the um, the DNA right now. We'll get to the RNA in a second. But good question. So hold on to that thought. So um, 
there's 22 pairs of homologous chromosomes, and then there's actually two chromosomes that are a pair, but one is an X. They can either be XX or XY. Those are the sex chromosomes. Uh, XX is the female, XY is the male, and um, that's why a lot of males are actually the weaker sex. So if there's any problem on any of the sex chromosomes, it's usually, in the, let's say it's in the X, and you have a male, it's not rescued. So the male is the one that suffers. So um, all you ladies, please treat us nicely because we're weak. Okay? We act strong, but it just covers up a, a fundamental weakness in us. Okay? Really, I swear to God. Oh, God, I, I'm getting weak. Um, okay, so. Now, the non sex chromosomes are called autosomes, and there's, then there's the sex chromosomes. Um, okay, we're going to go on to like short tandem repeats. These are used in forensic analysis, um, but they're going out of style. But um, in the past, there were 13 of them, usually, um, well, 13, each one on a different chromosome, let's say. And they're variable so that one individual might have, let's say, in that area, um, 10 repeats of a sequence, and another individual might have um, two. And so you can distinguish. And then, of course, if you have 13, it's very unlikely that one individual who's not related will share um, all those 13 loci in terms of the number of repeats. So you can actually identify who suspects are. Now they use something called... Um, short nucleotide polymorphisms, and it's just a single base pair change. And you use a bunch of them, and you, exactly, you can tell exactly which individual is which. Um, you, can, um, you can, first of all, in terms of getting these, uh, you first have a sample of DNA and you have to amplify it. How do we do that? What's the, what's the name of that process called? PCR. Okay? It's called PCR. And what you're doing is you're taking a small copy of the genome, of the genes, and then you're making many, many millions of copies. Um, and then you take those places where you have the repeats and you run them through a gel. And if you run them through a gel, the longer fragments move more slowly down the gel and the shorter fragments move more rapidly. And you're going from negative to positive. And uh, DNA, um, I think, has a, a negative charge or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, and here's all this. Um, okay, and then we've got um, a gene expression. Now, this is where we're getting down to RNA. Um, we know what the DNA looks like. Um, the only part that's important, that carries the information of the nucleotide base pairs. Um, and then, in terms of what happens with that, that information, DNA doesn't do anything. It's actually transcribed into a, um, a transcript of RNA called mRNA, messenger RNA. So that messenger RNA is identical to the DNA except that T's have been replaced with the U's. And then that mRNA is ferried out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. 
where a complex called a ribosome uh, begins to read it, read the code that was transcribed, and that then that, as it's reading it, it's adding amino acids to a long chain. Um, and that's what a protein is made of, a long chain of amino acids. Um, in terms of the transcript, it's transcribed using an enzyme called RNA polymerase that just goes down um, the, uh, the strand of DNA for where the gene is and copies it. Um, and there's actually a good, um, if you go to the Moodle page, you'll see there's a, a, a really good uh, video, it's about eight minutes long, I think, that kind of goes through um, transcription, trans translation, and also how DNA is actually um, stacked, but that's the main thing. Okay. And the ribosomes use um, another kind of RNA. It's called transfer RNA. Now, just so you know, in terms of gene regulation, there's actually thousands of different kinds of RNA, but we're not going to get into it. And it's all part of um, the regulatory apparatus for regulating gene expression. Okay. So remember that um, in terms of each cell has a complete genome, but which part of it is actually transcribed and translated depends on the cell type. So there's some, there's also, there's some um, genes that are always being transcribed. It's just part of, um, a, it's a gene that provides something for keeping the cell going, right? Uh, probably like glucose metabolism. And then there's also parts of the genome for specific kinds of tissues. Um, oh, uh oh, running out, okay. Um, so remember about the lactase gene in terms of, um, watch that little video, it's about 15 minutes long, about for mammals in general, the lactase gene is only expressed when a juvenile or baby mammal um, is alive. After they're weaned from the mother, it stops, except for in humans. Okay. Um, have any questions? You can come in and see me. Um, you can also go on the student discussion and post questions. And um, good luck. What? Are you going to email what you did in class right now? Yeah. Okay. I and I had a question about um, the mRNA and RNA in general. Yeah, you So is mRNA um, what happens before it turns into RNA? Or okay, no. So what happens is, um, here, hold on a second. Let me... Everything until that point. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. It's a good good question. Yeah. What scantron do we need for Wednesday? Yeah, same. The same one? Yeah. Okay. Yep, sure. Um, Are you going to be at your office? Yeah, right now. Come right, on right, by. Come on. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, 